Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our viewers from Fiji to Turkey of the Asia Pacific region and beyond. My name is Jose, and to our viewers, thank you very much for joining us again today in our productivity talk organized by the Asian Productivity Organization or the APO. Today's P talk topic is why behavioral insights matter in public policy. It is said that behavioral insights can offer a variety of benefits in the policy making such as cost effectiveness when testing multiple policy responses, when tried or experimented on a smaller scale to determine the best course of action. It also limits the risk of committing huge resources to the full implementation of a given policy and the involvement of the stakeholders or citizens to improve the effectiveness of policy making is just one of the benefits of behavioral insights. But what is behavioral insights? How do we employ it in the public sector? These are just some of the questions that we would like to address in this P talk. To share his knowledge and expertise on the topic, we are pleased to have with us today, Dr. Izar Chebin Mi, who is a consultant of the Malaysia Productivity Corporation on Behavioral Insights. He's also a consultant for developing a behavioral insights benchmarking report and facilitator of BI or a behavioral insights onboarding workshop for the public sector. He holds a PhD on information system engineering from the University of Bradford in England and PhD on management from the University of Uttara, Malaysia. Currently, he is the chairman and director of ASA Mobility SDN BHD Malaysia. Welcome, Dr. Izar, to our P talk. Would you like to say something to our viewers? Thank you, Dr. Jose. How are you? Uh, good morning, good afternoon to everyone, uh, the viewers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Izar. So we would like to encourage our viewers to send your questions or comments in the chat corner for Dr. Izar to answer during the Q&A session. Now we would like to invite Dr. Izar for his short presentation on the behavioral insights. Thank you, thank you, Jose. Let me bring my, my, my screen, share my screen for, for the audience. Please go ahead, sir. Yes. Okay. Okay, let me start. I hope all of you can, can see the, my slides very well. Okay, the title, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank APO and team for inviting me to share uh, the knowledge of behavioral insights in public policies. And I hope for the next 30 minutes, I should be able to answer the question posed by, on the title of the slide, why behavioral insights matter in public policies. Uh, for information, I've been actively involved in uh, regulatory works like, and with uh, Malaysia Productivity Corporations, as well as in productivity improvement and behavioral insights. Uh, for, your, uh, for your information, MPC or Malaysia Productivity Corporation is the leading agency being tasked by the government of Malaysia to lead all the behavioral insights uh, initiative improving public policy for, for the country. Okay, as we all know, public policies purpose or basically try to control individuals and firms' behavior towards the desired outcome. Okay, the final desired outcome, for example, for the for, for economy, we should see, or rather the country want to see the economy to keep on steadily grow. If the economy is growing, meaning that it will provide jobs, eh? hopefully a quality jobs, and eventually a better standard of living for the citizens. Similarly, for firms or for businesses, if you're having a good economy or a good outcome, meaning that they, it's easy for them to do business, easy for them to compete. And of course, they do not, the last thing that they would want actually the market to fail. On the other hand, for the environment, I think what we want actually, I think to preserve the environment or rather to improve the environment for the future generations. Uh, meaning that uh, we probably want actually to reduce the, the carbon monoxide uh, in in the in on, on on our country on earth and lastly for the social purpose social outcome we will have to have a healthy citizen to be educated citizen and 
a safe environment to protect all of us. So I guess the public policies created by a government or the state with the intention actually to uh, navigate individuals and firms towards the desired outcome that I just mentioned. Okay, traditionally, governments or states use three types of tools to basically to, man, uh, to control or to change the behavior of the uh, recipient, in this case, people or uh, firms. Uh, the first tool, actually regulations, a whole idea of regulation actually to direct uh, so-called uh, the stakeholders to the intended uh, outcome or to change the behavior from point A to point B towards a better outcome. If the, uh, the stakeholders or the recipient that, uh, doesn't move to or doesn't comply to the regulation, then perhaps the penalty or fine will be imposed to them, okay? But as we all know, to, to do it in this way, it's a very costly exercise because, and also the, the time taken to do it quite long. First, you need to gazette the law and then eventually come up with various uh, regulation guidelines before you can effectively administer and also enforce the regulation. Okay, the second tool, basically incentive or, or sometimes we call it, uh, it's known as subsidies as well as grants. Okay, the whole purpose is uh, basically to motivate or rather to attract or provide providing carrots to 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 peoples and basically to move from point uh, behavior A to behavior B. Okay, again, this is also not a uh, so-called a cheap exercise. It will cost a lot of uh, public money to 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 perform uh, the incentive. Last but not least, actually the uh, the most common one, I think government tend to use information. Uh, through advertisement, that through various could be TVs, newspapers, as well as social medias to inform publics, you know, about about a certain certain situation. For example, currently we have a uh, you know, COVID uh, pandemics throughout throughout the world. I think you see most of the government throughout the world will use information through advertising, uh, well, providing information about uh, wearing face masks and you know, alerting people, social distancing, and etc. So these are typical uh, three types of policy tool that go the government use basically to manage the behavior of the people or businesses. In all these tools, all these three tools, the key assumption or the primary assumption is uh, human is rational. Meaning that a human will take time, okay, will control himself, will take time to digest, to collect the information, uh, to deliberate it, uh, to analyze it, and then to weigh the cost benefits of it before making an, an so-called uh, so decision to choose one of the options. So they are well informed, they are uh, self-aware about the, the, the action that, you know, the, or rather the decision that they're going to make. So the question to, uh, to, uh, from me to you, is, is this uh, so-called happen all the time? I'm sure you have the answer. I'm sure the answer is no. In reality, we can see basically we probably notice easily notice that human is irrational. Basically, they are, they tend to make a quick decision, unlike the rational just now. Basically, we say that they they will take time to to decide, and they will time to 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 select what's what's the best option that give them the best benefit. But what's happened when you go to basically to, for example, to a soup, to a supermarket? I think you have a long list of uh, things to buy for, for your grocery. But at the end of the day, when you uh, basically come out, you will have added additional items in your uh, trolleys uh, when you check out. So that is out of the plan. So that shows that people are irrational as well. Similarly, if you go to a restaurant for, for, for your dinner, you will see, you know, you open up menu, you see lots of choices. And sometimes, you know, you just, based on your past experience, based on your heuristic or shortcut, you just select the either one, the one that you prefer. Probably, I want a stick, for, 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 for example. I want a burger, for, for, for example. Straight away without, you know, analyzing uh, the, the entire, entire option. Then again, 
that's this is confirmed that you know, people are not uh, so called fully uh, rash, rational or in other word people are uh, irrational people make just, judgment uh, by based on so called the environment that they, they they face at that time so another example of uh, what i term is uh, symptoms of irrationality for example you see that our local council as a from you know, basically uh, will collect tax from from residents and every six months or, or annually so unfortunately quite numbers of local councils are have facing challenges to to you know a poor collections of tax so if we say people are rational then people will then tend to uh, to pay their the uh, so-called local council tax promptly because the tax will be used to funding uh, the activities of the local council, for example, collecting garbage and etc. But that doesn't happen. Similarly, I think the second example here, lacks of interest in participating in community initiative. Again, I think the initiative tend to be a good one. But unfortunately, I think in many cases, you will see not many people and you know, even though they are aware it is a good one, they, they don't willing to put up enough you know, to participate in those initiatives. And the last one, miss uh, the third example, miss medical appointment. This is quite a common problems. I think sometimes uh, you know people make an appointment but they don't turn up, but they don't see the implication of you know the wastage of uh, doctors' efforts, times, which is cost to the to the to the government. Again, these are symptoms of a long list of uh, symptoms. And I'm sure you, you will notice it. Again, this is also justify, justifying that people are not uh, rational. Okay, the next few slides, what I will uh, walk you through, basically uh, on behavioral insight as a policy tool. Okay, we have three tools earlier, regulation, we have incentive as well as information, and the fourth one actually make use of behavioral insights. Beverage insights, I think, uh, works in uh, as a policy tool, or rather, in the in the policy tool making, it's quite I would say quite recent. Uh, perhaps you can see lots of work happening for uh, less than fifteen years ago, especially when uh, uh, the terms of behavioral economics uh, you know, by Richard Taylor, as well as uh, the uh, the Nash uh, books okay, released in two thousand eight by Richard Taylor as, as well as Carl Sunstein. So then the, the spurs basically triggers all these uh, you know, activities or interest in the government as well. Uh, I think in 2010, I think the Nash unit started in the UK Prime Minister office. Then it shows a good result, eventually been privatized and been spread out throughout, throughout the world. Similarly, a lot of activities also happen in in US. Okay, Be, uh, uh, behavioral insight for me, I think in simple uh, term, behavioral insight is, is basically just like uh, like a framework, basically, basically a framework to study or you know, basically through inductions of uh, activity, how people decide, how people you know uh, think, how people make 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 a, make a dis decision, and then, then the framework basically start with you know identifying problems and then also basically just uh, identify what are the behavioral gaps and subsequently plan for put up some strategies and then plan for the implementations of uh of, of, of the initial uh, uh, behavioral in initiative uh, as i said earlier there's a this uh, this uh, i would say one of the most popular books in in, in, in this subject called nash eh? uh, it was uh, basically produced in 2008 by Richard Taylor as well as Castel Sunstein. Uh, the whole idea of uh, basically the, the theory, the, the, the Nash theory says basically uh, pe pe we can alter so-called people behavior in a predictable way. We can alter how people make a decision in a predict predictable way without forbidding any options or significantly changing their economic incentive. Okay, the whole thing, but... Uh, uh, both the author says actually they determine as choice architecture. In other words, we are setting up uh, so called an architecture of choices or option for people to decide. So, if we were, we, we can modify this uh, so called architecture or this choice, we can then subtly influence the you now basically a person decision. For example, if we were to go to, to to so called cap cafeteria, I think quite a popular example. Basically, you can alter the positions of how you put health healthy foods. 
the vegetable, fruits, and etc. Maybe to the strategic place. And the result, actually, people tend to, you know, the, in the numbers of uh, uh, consumptions for, for the, the healthier food increased uh, significantly. Similarly, I think uh, if you will go to a buffet uh, lunch, for example, sometimes you don't want to take a whole piece of apple. But if you were to cut it out into a smaller chunk, then 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 you then you will basically see and you know, see the increase in numbers of apple consumption. So in other words, we can nudge or we can alter people's decision by you know uh, arranging the the so-called the option that they 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 they, they would uh, will influence the way the way they they will decide. And uh, the nudge, to count as a mere nudge, the intervention must be easy and cheap to avoid. Nudges are not mandated. Okay? You are not, you cannot, you cannot force people to select A option, but you must allow them to have A to B, C, and D option. But perhaps, you, but you only nudge or you already influence them subtly to, to choose the A option that you want, because that should give a better outcome for, for, for the poor people. Okay, I'll bring two examples from, from Malaysia. I think and in Malaysia, of course, uh, we have our income tax filing exercise typically end up uh, for, for citizen by uh, June. So what happened at the early, uh, early days I think of the online ta income tax filing, uh, people tend the compliance rate are not so high. Okay, then what have been done by so-called our, our regulators or income tax regulators or at the agency. So what they have done actually after the second and third year, they start pre-fill the form, okay, to make it simple for people. So based on last year declaration, so it will pre-fill all this data or populate all this data in the field of the, your current, uh, so-called your latest assessment. So with that, if you are satisfied, there's no change or minimum change, then you can complete the, the entire thing so you know very fast and very very easy it typically take 10 10 minutes so suddenly you will see the compliance rates of uh, income tax filings uh, increase tremendously and people start moving away from traditionally using manual form towards towards uh, e-filing currently uh, you know for the last few years in malaysia 100 percent of income tax filing is done through e-filing the second uh, uh, option here, yeah, basically, uh, in many governments, uh, people are promoting cashless payment. As we know, cashless payment will bring lots of benefits. So in this particular picture, I'll bring you examples of uh, and, uh, some of the works that we have done in, in Malaysia, basically to improve so-called cashless payment at the counter. In this particular uh, example, actually, road transport department counter, where people have a choice whether to pay cash or cashless at that, uh, at, you know, at, at the counter when you want to make your payment. So, for example, uh, what they need to do here, for example, they need to pay for their car or tax. They need to renew their driving driving license. So, at the counter, then the staff will ask whether you want to pay in cash or cashless. So, due to COVID nineteen pandemic, as well as uh, the, the so called the policies of the government want to go for uh, so called cash cashless pay payment. So, what they have done actually, we want to see how can we boost the, the rate. Okay, we took six uh, so-called uh, the branches, which is a non-control uh, so, so, uh, experiment. Well, of course, we do have a few in the control, which is, we do that in the treatment. Initially, we'll see about 30, uh, on the average, about 30, 40% people using cashless payment. So what we have done, actually, we alter, now not just simply by, by putting these imposters, and we'll then study the decide and then see how many counters they may use of uh, uh, cashless and uh, cash payment, then we alter that. Basically, we, we increase numbers of counters with uh, cash, cashless payment and reduce numbers of counters with cash and cashless payment. As a result, you know, we, we plus together with some, some posters and, uh, and some, some campaign, we'll see a sudden rise in, in the so-called compliance. Basically, it goes from you know thirty percent, forty percent within two months. It goes to ninety-five, and currently it's about ninety-nine to hundred percent for the six branches that un that undergo the so-called the trial. So, as to to the government achieve the outcome because the outcome is actually to move to cashless, 
And with that, actually, we achieve efficiency for, for the regulators and do, they do not need to manage uh, hard cash. So, so it's better for, 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 I think, both sides, for the citizens, easy, faster, and so on, but as well for, for the government, for the regulators, you know, actually they improve their operational efficiency and the final outcome is as what, what the intended for, for, from the government. Okay, now I think um, the, the question that posed in, on the first slide, why behavioral insight matters in public policy? So let me use the next few slides, try to answer the question. Okay, my first answer, I think it's proven uh, as of uh, 2017, OECD survey at that time, there are about more than 200 institutions basically carrying out, uh, testing out uh, so-called behavioral insight initiative in public policies. And quite numbers of them achieve a remarkable result. Okay, for example, in the, I think in UK, in organ donation, I think by adding some um, uh, tax, and uh, basically if, if you want you want an out, so called if not sticker, if you want an, an uh, organ, so please please do so something like that, and then and then of course you know, the broadcast it uh, through SMS or through, through letter, then suddenly it turned out that the in, improvement of hundred thousands, you know, uh, new uh, so called organ uh, donors. Similarly, in the, I think in in the, in the case of uh, pension saving. By altering the option, currently you have option to enroll, but then just simply modify you are by default enrolled and you have the option to check uh, to not to not, not to join the programs. So it will increase another time was taken 10 million uh, uh, so-called new uh, so-called uh, new subscribers to the to the pension programs. But uh, the one that uh, probably in particular that I want to highlight here, I think there is a work done by. I think University of California, Berkeley. So what they've done, actually they've gone through the detailed data and are conducted by BI team and some other organization. And it's taken out of 126 experiment data, okay, one by one, by one which involve about 23 million uh, people. Okay, 126 trial data involving 23 million people and the, uh, the, the interesting outcome, actually, there is an increase about 8% or, you know, or rather pro producing better result compared to the control trial. 8% compared to control trial, which is the group um, uh, which have not uh, received any, any interventions or any, any, any treatment. So that's a very, very positive uh, result. And very, of course, there's a very systematic science, uh, not very detailed analysis that prove, you know, in a bigger context, you now how effective is the behavioral insight, in particular nudges, okay, to improve public policies. And, sim and in the in the study conducted by University of California, out of 123 uh, trial, 60% of them hardly use any fund, any money. So that will answer the second question, actually cost, uh, the second point that I put on my slide, actually very cost effective. If you were, imagine if you were to do it through incentive, if you were to do it through regulation, you won't be able to achieve that because, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's costly and uh, will consume lots of public money. So with this uh, proven, uh, or rather active participation and proven effectiveness of the, of the, uh, initiative, a BI initiative, and cost effective, that should basically give us a strong clue or strong hints or strong direction that we should seriously consider behavioral insight for public policies and even, even for improvement in various uh, in, in, improvement uh, in our organizations, improvement in compliance to regulation, improvement in take up rates for incentive, and etc. Next one, I think uh, if you notice some example that I, I mentioned earlier, for example, you know, by changing the default uh, options of pension saving to, to by default, all of them enroll into the program, I thought it's that's easier easier to implement, right? You don't need the, the campaign, you don't need to um, you know, use lots of funds, and doing that, I think, is just a matter of a public uh, a policy, and I guess it will be easier to implement as compared to other traditional tools. 
Okay, the okay, that's the I guess best based on the result. But if you look at that, I guess I would say the process of doing it, how good it is. Okay, I think if you see most uh, quite common, if you see most uh, behavioral insight uh, initiative, make use of randomized control trial or better known as RCTs. Okay, this will reduce certain sources of bias when testing the effectiveness of new treatments. Basically, what is RCT is all about? If you were, let's say, let's say you want to test about 1,000 people, and you probably perhaps uh, you know, break it out into randomly break, you know, break uh, group it into four different groups, one, two, three, and four, and perhaps the group number one does not uh, is a control uh, group, it's not does not receive any any treatment. Group number one will receive a different set of treatment compared to group number two and number three. So due to the nature of randomized uh, so-called so -called sampling distribution them into and uh, distribute them into different these are four groups, then basically will increase okay or rather reduce uh, the unnecessary bias to 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 the experiment. Then that's a quite quite uh, powerful uh, thing. Uh, so-called techniques or uh, you know, in in ensuring the so-called the robustness or rigorousness of of uh, of the experiment. Secondly, actually, in and in this in context in in BI projects, basically you will perform behavioral analysis. Basically, will identify what are the behavior behavior barriers and drivers, and what to see what are the gaps. In I would say quite de quite quite de quite detail as compared to probably a traditional tool. You just perhaps make certain assumptions, you know, based on the certain set of data. That's how people are going going to behave. Okay, and uh, again, so within the process, we make use of lots of uh, primary data. Then typically, you collect the data uh, from from sample. Could it could be through your surveys and uh, other means, and uh, that's basically will give up a, a good a good insights or a so called a good uh, information about 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 your 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 target your populations, the target population. I would say this will basically strengthens. Uh, the whole, the, the, the whole, uh, the whole initiative, the whole study that you want to carry out. Of course, uh, implementing behavioral insights is, uh, especially for for in public policy, is also is a challenge to to some countries or to to, to probably that for the newcomers, yeah, new uh, so called for the first time. Because I think um, for a start, like like Malaysia, probably not many of us are aware, you know, especially in the public sector staff are aware about behavioral insight per se and they only started at the last few years no doubt okay they probably has, and some of them has implemented it without uh, so called their, their their knowledge okay that the so called the true knowledge of behavioral science behavioral economics etc but uh, you see there are some projects the earlier project they have done there are some elements to that but of course there is no there's no I would say here structured programs that 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 that, that you know, to 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 improve their awareness, improve their skill, how to carry out behavioral insight initiative. So this is, I would say, the biggest knowledge, as the biggest challenges, where, people, where probably for, for someone who want to start you know, behavioral insight policy to take a look, one component, actually the human factor, uh, the resources. And then, um, of course, this knowledge typically uh, exists within the academia, within the universities. But then they probably lack an opportunity to 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 try it out in in so called for public policy. Whereas we within the government we have a lot we do you know, we make policies, and you know, very often that almost you know, every day in various ministries and uh, government agencies. Okay, but then probably we lack uh, within the public sector we lack of the knowledge the detailed knowledge of uh, the psychology the behavioral science behavioral economics and so on. Probably there's also needs to to bridge that these two these two group of people, you know, so that the, the academia have a practical ground to to test it out and practical problem to to to, to test out the so called the so called the works. So again, the human factor is a, is a challenge, and uh, I think if you can resolve that, then then uh, we will definitely boost up boost up so called your effort to try out the so called the, the, the I'm gonna say new tools at the recent most tool of public policies in, in improving uh, so-called all the various policies that the government want, uh, want to use. Okay. So just in conclusion for my presentation, because we turn it to the question and answer, okay, behavioral insights has proven 
that it can be used as policy tools in achieving intended outcome, as far as mentioned earlier, as what has been studied by by you know, uh, rigorously by University of California, as I you know, as I quoted earlier. Secondly, policy make uh, my my encouragement for policy maker to show develop competencies, okay, basically skills among 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 their uh, their staff, especially those that make it directly involved in making policy in adopting behavioral insight in policy making process. With that, I think I'll end my presentation, and then I'll pass back to I guess uh, to Jose for 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 your no, for for you to 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 facilitate the question and answer session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Izar, for explaining to us the background uh, of behavioral insights, uh, taking back to us the nudge theory and the book that you have sh shared to us and giving us some examples. Uh, we have questions from the audience, but before that, uh, let, uh, let me just uh, go back to the basic discussion of this P talk. I know you have answered the questions on why do behavioral insights uh, matter in public policy and you give all those reasons. Uh, my first question is maybe you could also cite the case of Malaysia. How can we embed behavioral insight applications in the government? Uh, like for example, you mentioned the, the tax system, the filing system and the cashless in Malaysia. So how did you em embed that kind of behavioral insight applications in the government? That's my first question before I will raise questions from our viewers. Our viewers are also encouraged to send your questions and comments okay. uh, in the okay. chat box of YouTube. So please, sir. Okay, Dr. Jose, to answer your question, how we can embed behavioral insight in in our, our policy making or I think in our, you will not notice actually in any things that you want to do, be it uh, just a purely a, you know, policies or uh, be it actually throughout uh, through regulations, incentive, and so on, definitely you can't run away from the human factors. Okay, human, that's that's that, that's the whole idea. Basically, you want to change the, the, the behavior of the people, behavior of citizens, human individuals, or even firms, firms also, that could be workers, it could also be that there's management of the firms. So, so definitely we cannot run from, from the human. So if you can truly identify, okay, so called the, the real behavior, the, the real decision points that you want to do it, then basically we can basically nudge, we can uh, come out, modify the environment, create option and so on. So to embed, I think as it, there's, no, uh, there's no issue. I think there are lots of opportunity for us to, 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 to go in and so called embed behavior insight into, into the government projects. But of course, the challenge, as I said earlier, is actually the skill, so called the competencies of the part, the policy makers, the public sector, uh, so who, particularly the public sector staff, is actually to how will, how can I use behavior inside? There are steps, okay? The whole idea is actually you got to so identify, uh, the, to analyze the behavior, then you, you, you know, come up with your strategy and you want to carry out your experiment. That is, like, I would say, the challenge. It's not, I think, uh, testing it through Bavarian's uh, inside. If you can find the right the why if the, you know, people are irrational, I think that should not, that, that, that's, 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 that's a clear opportunity. But how to you know, tackle that, uh, that so called opportunity or uh, do, uh, making improvement through Bavarian's inside is the challenge. How to use the tool is, I guess, I would say the bigger challenge compared to you know, uh, implement, uh, embed it into in, in Bavarian's inside. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for answering my question. Uh, I have more questions, but let me just pick up a question from our viewers. So again, I would like to remind our viewers. So if you have questions, so you can or comments to this topic uh, on today's P talk. So please uh, send them in our chat box in YouTube. So there is a question here from uh, Mr. Malok. So COVID lockdowns have negatively impacted business production and country's economy. How, uh, in this case, uh, uh, the topic on behavioral insight shape policy to balance public health and safety in its economy. So, do you have any view on this question, sir? Uh, well, okay. Uh, we will see. I think the first we and let's analyze the situation, the lock, the lockdown, which is uh, I think the government put up a regulation or more or less. Uh, that's okay. It's country lockdown. So, so that's nothing much, of course. Uh, with that, actually, okay. Uh, Straight away, people say there is real. There's no opportunity for for using behavior insight. But if you were to analyze slightly deeper, 
then I think there are there is a real opportunity within that. Actually, you know that people cannot do the way they do run their, their business. For example, they would they were to do it face to face businesses, they cannot do that. For example, if any any economic activity cannot be done through face to face because of the lockdown. So then I think probably perhaps we can then uh, because that's probably the problem. I would say the problem statement. Then probably then probably we analyze how we can nudge, how we can influence people to move away, and you know, rather to consider the alternative, which is online, e-commerce, and so forth. Right. So the, then I think the policy maker, I thought the government should then start quickly rather I you know use behavioral insight to influence people or to make for them to make a decision to look for a digital options or e-commerce and for, for what not. Of course, subsequently, it will need to be beef up through, uh, for example, through to the, the competency of uh, in, in using it online. So through information. So it's not just a purely a BI strategy. It could be a BI strategy to swing that so-called so influence them and also supplement them with so-called training, with the information and how they can they can enable that. So I think there's still opportunity to do to, 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 to that. Of course, we got to really drill down to the real problem, root cause of the problem, and see who are the actors involved. And then, then we can implement a so-called so -called, uh, behavioral insight. But then we know that the point that we need to nudge is the other, where are their decision points. Thank you, Jose. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I have a follow-up question to that because recently I, we all know that we are in the pandemic situation and earlier you right. cited examples that social distancing or wearing masks, these are regulation-based, uh, you know, kind right. of shaping behavior of people. But uh, there must be a way of addressing uh, how to re address this kind of problem by applying BI. But before I will go back to that, let me ask one more question from our viewers. So we have a question here from Dr. Ida Yassin. So her question is, in order to shape people's behavior, do you think BI should be introduced before carrot and stick initiatives? So that is our question uh, from because Dr. Because as I said, the carrot, which is the uh, so-called multi-incentive, and stick, which is our regulation, as I said earlier, are expensive exercise, right? To enforce it, to gazette it, and those are expensive exercise. If you have a real opportunity to do it through BI, the, there's a high probability the exercise is very cheap and easier to implement. So in that sense, I would say, because uh, BI are closer to people irrationality, then I would always say that probably that's the best option, as I agree with uh, Dr. Ida, Okay, this is, I would say, the best option to consider first before you use carrot and stick because carrot and stick are not cheap. Thank you, Jose. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, okay, I have, uh, while waiting for other viewers to log in their questions, so I have a question. Uh, again, I'm going back to the fundamentals because I know BI, at least for the Asian product organization, is something new area that we are exploring. Mm -hmm. And I know Malaysia has already started the use of BI, yeah, especially in the public sector. So my question is, if a government, uh, of course, many governments, I assume, have not uh, uh, applied or used BI yet. So if a government has not yet applied behavioral insights, where or how should it start? Okay. Can you give us an example, uh, at least in, in your case, how did you start? Well, yeah, let me share, let me share the so Malaysian experience. Of course, initially, we'll, I think well, in the last few years, I think the Malaysian, especially in Malaysian productivity cooperation, I think we uh, will see that there's lots of activities of BI, especially in, in Europe and US. So with that, actually, we start send, we start send, uh, we now we're standing our, our, our uh, people as well as uh, some, some uh, policy makers also to, to learn about BI. And uh, of course, from the, so come from the visits and uh, from attending a number of conferences, then we decide, yes, it's uh, important, important for the country and we should go for it. And since then, then we developed some strategies, some plans, how to get involved with that. And uh, then we identify that I think in the next five years, in fact, we have set our plan, we have set our target that we need to have at least three to 400 public sectors uh, staff to be competent in in so-called uh, implementing behavioral insight okay to do that to do that i think for the start as i said the knowledge in within the academia we drop in the academia as well and then we'll seek advice you know from 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 you know 
PI team from from OECDs yeah. and of course with our our own experts. Actually, then we start formulate and start building out this thing. We last year alone we involved in I think easily about twenty case studies on uh, straight away implementing BI in various uh, various uh, areas. And this year also we we'll keep on repeating that, and then we just devise uh, training modules for for behavioral insights. So all this actually to again to 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 get out, we will roll out the so-called training module through to again through through digital through online to 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 allow a better reach of you know, lots of people, and definitely it will be free free of charge from 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 our perspective. The whole out the whole idea the whole outcome that you want actually, lots of people, especially in the public sector, okay, aware about the BI and then hopefully pick up pick up the whole idea. So again. Decide whether it's important or not. I believe the answer is clear. It is important. Then put up some strategies. I think put up a group and you know, develop the core groups. And then uh, you know within the academia, within the support policy makers, and within the so-called professional in the private sectors, and jump into numbers of case studies. Learn as throughout, throughout, the, throughout the process and develop the yeah, so-called maybe process that custom to to your to your site. And then develop training module and roll out the training module and so on. I think that should be, I would say, the the uh, so called the way forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, actually, I have a follow up question to that, uh, but I will come back to that later. Let me uh, ask this question first from our viewer, uh, Mr. Muhammad Feroze Khan. So his question is: How far the BI or behavioral insights considerations and analysis? are essential at the time of policy formulation to make the policy successful i would say as the as early as possible you consider bi you consider so called human factor test will be the best okay especially at the, you know when you set up with the agenda of course when you identify the problems when you explore the options that will be i would say the best the best the best timing the best as early as possible and rather than during the implementation, that's probably the compliance rates that you that you want you you want you want to consider about that. But as early as possible, and of course you include that in your design process. You I take into account why you know why people will behave in this way. You no. know you know all the the possible environment because again you need to provide them a good options, a good choice for 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 them to then agree. I think uh, rather I would I would suggest that he has to be as early as possible in the in the process policy life cycle thank you thank you very much sir for answering the question so uh, i'd like to go back to your early example by citing how malaysia or at least those agencies involved in bi are preparing themselves like you have gone through training you prepare uh, some kind of uh, modules to train civil servants and you have gone through mission outside the region or outside the country so my question is Okay, that is the side of the government uh, in preparing itself for, you know, uh, adapting this BI. So the question is, how can citizens benefit from the application of BI? Uh, I know uh, you gave us some examples earlier, but could you elaborate more on how the citizens on the other side will benefit? Yeah, I think uh, let's say let's come back to the the income tax uh, uh, filing example. It used to be, and of course, in the manual process long process got to file and you know, uh, write everything declare your names and etc etc i think easily you take 30 minutes or so to fill out the form and so on as the government as the income tax department move to so-called e-filings at the initial the initial stage i think probably it takes you like 15 minutes or so to type in your name and etc and as they move at the program they, they, they learn that it's important to make it easy uh, by pre-filling -fill, pre the, the so-called form based on the last year data then two citizens, as I said earlier, could be five minutes exercise. If you're happy, then probably two, three minutes, you can just submit your filings. That's the obvious benefits. May not be that significant, but can that's the obvious benefit to citizen. Similarly, I think in countries where, where organ donations are, you know, uh, take up so-called donors are uh, increased tremendous, tremendously, I think it's, I guess, the, the real benefits actually to the future recipient people who wanted to have a so-called organ from from the organ donors since you have a long list of organ donors you know then easy for 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 citizen to 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 i guess to receive the the donation uh, for my road transport department just now i think again for now time to go to the counters and make payments are very swift 
because it allows easy because the cost is because it's cashless and easy to make payment and the, the entire process is very swift so I, obviously i think i would say benefits for them uh, to, to the citizen for example uh, for the local council if the local council manage to collect a good uh, so-called tax for for the local council i'm sure the service there won't be disrupted or probably hopefully they also can improve further they pay the further the service with the fund that they they have I think this are some example, Jose. Of course, the black anchor is many, many other examples. Thank you very much, sir. So uh, for sharing those examples and the case of Malaysia. So I have a follow-up question earlier to the question of Mr. Uh, Mr. Khan about the success of application of BI. So actually, uh, this is just a follow-up question to that question. So my question actually is, is the use of behavioral insights in policy making an assurance of successful policy implementation? Well, if you implement it, okay. Well, I'm sure it will Im improve probability of success of, of, of the so-called you know, achieving the outcome or so-called intended uh, by, by the government. But of course, in doing so, there are also challenges. Of course, I know, I know, I'm sure people will then see how, you know, if you make a wrong choice, set up a wrong choice, then you may bring now so-called so -called uh, our uh, people and so on to choose it. You know what not supposed to be to 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 to, to, to be the the, the so-called optimum choice so that's that's danger so i would say the choice architect in the case of nudging the choice architects are crucial as to ensure that you have all the possibilities to ensure that you know uh you know the the right the right choice uh, that, that the one that we want that people to go if this uh you know uh, hopefully if there is no bias in in in, in coming up with the choice if that's happened Probably the so-called ethical issues will come into the pictures, and it may not attend, uh, you know, end up to what what you want you want them to, you know, the so-called to 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 so-called to, to to behave as as per 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 the, per the real intended outcome. Sir, I have uh, thank you very much for raising the the issue of uh, rational choice or human beings. Or we have always choices. So uh, I have this follow up question to that explanation you have. So in general, uh, are behavioral insights applied based on the assumption that individuals do not always follow the theory of rational choice? Earlier, you mentioned there are two kinds of individuals. I mean, well, I know behavior, so the rational yeah. one and the rational one. So does it right. mean that when uh, we apply behavioral insights, it's based on the assumption that individuals not always follow the theory of rational choice? Uh, this, this basically, as I said, uh, because of, uh, you, you know, we can see that people are not so-called irrational. That's why the whole subjects of you know behavioral economics come into the pictures. Then they then they study what people are not 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 rational. They're supposed to be rational, but of course we know that that's a limit capacity for for people. They call it bounded bounded choice theory. So people are not able to uh, to to decide for themselves because uh, so now too complex. If you for example, if you see the labels of uh, products, the ingredients at the backs of. Uh, cereal package or the bags of whatever goods you buy from supermarket so lots of probably 20 lines item and our calorie and etc etc i don't think normal yeah, people specific. are able to understand it or to compute you know the whole intended or the whole purpose of that products are prescriptions our products are details as well for, for, for specific purpose but i don't think i would say 99 percent of people won't read it but if you were to make it simple, you know, but to highlight that uh, this product has high content of sugar and put a clearly uh, red markers or red, you know, signal, and people probably are normal people. Uh, it probably makes sense. So yeah, I, yeah, I do probably want to avoid this product and probably I will, I'll go for a more healthier products. So I guess it, it is, a, a, that's a called the whole subject is to study why people are not rational or irrational. And from there, we come up with the solutions. Yeah, thank you very much, sir, for that. I, I think that's a very complicated uh, point because, you know, like uh, your example sites, like if I want more, uh, like I like sugar, I like a sweet food, yeah. but we know that the sweet food is not good for my health. And if I'm not right. healthy because of this lifestyle, so the health 
services of the government will be, you know, uh, I say, uh, will be burdened by that kind of behavior of people. So how do we encourage people to limit the intention? So I like that example. So uh, right. let me uh, ask you again. Uh, we have another question from Mr. Malok. Uh, uh, in the YouTube here. So in business excellence, I think you're very familiar with this BE framework. One of best practices is being customer centric. Does BI consider people centric as one possible starting point? Yeah, uh, there's a behavioral insights about behavior, correct, uh, Mr. Musamalo? It's about people. The focal point is about people and the focal points about behavior and the focal points about how people thinking how people make decision. So I guess, I guess important. Definitely, I think in the case of business excellence, of course, there's one component that's the people. Uh, could be, as I said, the customers. If you know the behavior of the customers, we can nudge them better. I'm sure uh, an organization can improve their, their sales, can improve their, their, the product that, that meet the customer call their customer needs. So yes, even knowing uh, behavioral insight within a company, within an organization, is a very, very, very important to, to improve so-called pickup rate, so-called the sales of the product and the customer service for that matter and so on. Because we are dealing with people. Yeah, thank you very much, sir, for explaining. So in this case, we deal with citizens. So it should be citizen-centric. Right approach when we apply BI. Sir, I have uh, another uh, question here, and, and I, I'd like to know whether this is the case of Malaysia. I know you've been doing a lot of work, uh, training, workshop, and you also are a consultant uh, on this matter in the country. So I'd like to ask this question. Is there any specific sector okay, in which behavioral insights can be applied more successfully, assuming that a government regulatory mechanism is in place? Uh, the answer, uh, I would say the answer is no specific sectors, basically apply to all sectors. Of course, you see lots of, uh, throughout the world, lots of people started perhaps in the health, healthcare sectors, and then uh, perhaps subsequently in the, in the education sectors. But often recently, you see, you know, when it got, uh, when government, uh, public service delivery, when government dealing with tax, government dealing with the local council tax, income tax, and some reg other regulatory compliance, this, as I said, again, you cannot run away from, from, from citizen, from human, from, from make people making uh, decisions. So there are lots of opportunity and has been proven uh, in throughout the world. I think if you look at various literatures, publication, you can see various kinds of works uh, and has been carried out. But it caution you, but of course, it has to be contextual dependent. You cannot just simply cut and paste, take the, 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 other, the other result and just copy and implement it. Yes, you can consider it for as your input, but it has to be contextual based. It may, it may you know, may de depend on, on the, the surround, surrounding environment that where you want to experiment it. I see. Okay, so basically the bottom line is it doesn't really... Uh, address specific sector, but no. it takes uh, yes. the whole role of the government. Okay, sir, so yeah. uh, of course, so far we have talked about uh, the benefits or the good points or the strengths of the BI in this case. So my question is, uh, at least in your experience when you run this in the country, is there any opposition to the use and application of BI in policy making? I mean, uh, so when you put this as a center of you know, policy making, is there any opposition on the use and application of this tool? In the case of, the, of course, uh, because we are in Malaysia, I, I would say we are we, are, we are involved with quite, 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 quite new. I think, I, think, I guess people, as the government is quite open. Of course, initially, of course, I would say the, the, the position or rather the challenge actually more towards actually understanding it. And some people uh, may assume that, yeah, I, that, yeah, I know about it. Then some policymakers may state that way, I know about it, so, but it's still different. But, but in reality, of course, they doesn't know the, the, the difference between uh, the approach, the behavioral insight, the importance of uh, having uh, real, uh, so-called uh, rigorous testing, uh, collecting uh, data, see the behavioral gaps, and so, so forth. Because uh, that's, that's, that's one challenge you may experience from some of the policymakers. Uh, but other than that, I think I think for the position, of course, we have not come to that point yet. Probably the, the ethical issues, uh, because people uh, may may probably say that why oh, you nash people in this way because you are you are you know you 
forced in a way subtly you're forcing people in that way we have not come across to that issue but i'm i know that the issue has been uh, so called uh, discussed okay in uh, inter internationally the practicality of, of of you know nudging people to a pre preferred option by by so called so called the government but i don't i don't see much issue if you present it uh, you, you frame it and uh, correctly you give a right message and uh, when uh, especially the policy makers understand it the public uh, you know the public understand the purpose to improve uh, the outcome then then i uh, don't foresee there will much uh, so called an uh, issue of uh, introducing bi in public policy yeah thank you very much sir for for, for your answer uh, you just gave me the idea i connect back to our discussion earlier about uh about uh, people uh, rational or irrational and you know then when because i know bi in your explanation is also like uh, experience or evidence-based uh, policy making right. so we experiment to a small group first before we launch the policy otherwise uh, before we commit uh, or the government commits a big resources uh, in implementing right. that policy so i uh, thank you for that so of course sir, i have one last question before we end this session so i cannot uh, help but ask this because as an Asian okay. product organization, so I'd like to ask this question. So how can BI or behavioral insights, uh, insight applications improve public sector productivity? Or is there any direct link between behavioral insight and public sector productivity? Uh, I know you mentioned some examples earlier, which I believe uh, public sector productivity has increased, but uh, please uh, uh, answer this question to contextualize this topic uh, in relation to public sector productivity okay um well if you look at uh, for example public sector uh, public sector efficiency framework for example i think i think what what even even we are public sector we are we are produ mostly we are producing services to, to public right we are producing services to public so we could use uh, behavioral insight to those people involved in pr producing that service Okay, perhaps we can nudge them, or rather we can we can use as a BI, experimental BI, to make sure you know, they make a correct decision, reducing uh, mistakes. So in other words, we're improving the quality. So we will basically be improving the productivity. Uh, we you know we nudge them. Of course, we need to 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 then uh, go detail uh, study again where the, the points that they make decision and where you know based on the, the past data that we see whether you know. They make uh, there are room for improvement, and we we nudge them correctly. So, actors involved in producing the services, those are our targets. Where you know where the points that they make decision, that's our focal point. So, if there is opportunity for us to nudge them to a better uh, so-called uh, result, definitely it will improve the productivity, I guess, the quality of the service, and eventually produce the effectiveness where the recipient, the citizen, will receive a better quality service. So as a whole, yes, I would say, there may not be a simple direct correlation, as if you know, basically BI and productivity, but definitely, you know, we are the government we are producing our service where it could be a teaching service medical services and then we'll do you know we could do patrolling uh, for the security those are services we are producing that and there are actors in within with uh, that along along that supply chain in producing the service definitely we can uh, use pi to improve the improve their decision and resulting a, a better service quality service and maybe a more efficient service that's basically improving productivity of public sector. Thank you very much, sir, for highlighting that. Uh, being an Asian product organization, so we would like to directly hear it from you as an expert. Sir, uh, sorry, uh, I said that was the last question, but let me just ask this, and maybe you could give also a very quick answer. Uh, we have right. uh, one last question from our viewers, so let me just ask okay. this, sir. So the question is uh, from uh, Mr. Al Hilal Ibrahim Rahmat, do you think the BI help to reduce corruption? Ah, well, good question, definitely, Mr. Al Hilal. I think BI reduce correction, uh, reduce corruption. Definitely, we can as I said, people are make uh, that are involved in the corruption process also. So, so also a, a person, uh, so called individual, or could be a group individual. There are opportunity for us to nudge, uh, for us to 
uh, that uh, may not be that similar. There's a one study we had done, done it last year on improving integrity in the procurement department of public sector in Malaysia. So we, uh, we come up with some, uh, some program, through the program, we come up with uh, the Nash intervention program. And at the post, uh, so-called uh, the pre and post test, at the post test, we see there's uh, the significant improvement in, in uh, also called, uh, well, on that sense, actually, we're talking about integrity and uh, as well as corruption in, in so-called in the public sector. And we see it's an improvement, there's some uh, awareness, there's some so-called uh, intention for them, you know, uh, to reduce uh, that or could be to report in the case of the, the spot, the cor corruption uh, ha ha happening. So, yes, I would say we have done it last year in a, in a small experiment in, in uh, two or three so-called government agency. Um, well, then um, based on the nudging programs, then, you know, then, then we'll see there's uh, some positive uh, uh, result towards that. I would say yes. Thank you very much for answering that one final question, Dr. Izar. So uh, to our viewers, so we would like to end the P talk today. And let me conclude the discussion and presentation uh, on the topic of uh, why behavioral insights matter in public policy. So from the presentation and discussion, we can conclude that public policy needs to understand, need to understand human behavior better and promote behavioral change through a more scientific approach to make the policy more effective. So behavioral insights may be or may not have been applied yet in the policymaking process, especially in the region, but awareness of its value and applications is growing in recent years. So in some countries, it is already embedded in the decision-making process across government bodies. In fact, they have already established a dedicated agency for this purpose. So, and we hope that through this PITO, we are able to shed light on the topic and provide more evidence-based discussion with examples from Malaysia. Hence, we hope that you find this session insightful and useful, especially for the public sector. So we would like to thank, uh, sincerely thank uh, Dr. Izar for joining us today. So, sir, your final message, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Oh, thank Izar. Thank you, everyone. I think, uh, especially to, to, to... Okay, sir. So, Welcome, Jose, thank you. So thank you very much, Dr. Izar, and thank you very much to our viewers for watching this program. And we would like to invite you to continue watch our series of productivity talk of the Asian Productivity Organization. So please stay tuned with our next P talk and please stay safe and healthy in this pandemic time. So thank you very much, sir, and thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. Goodbye. Yeah, bye bye.